Hey, I'm so glad to be joined back on Bad Faith Podcast by Ross Barkan, who, of course, you know his Substack, but he is also now a staff writer at New York Magazine. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Uh, excited to be back and, and talk uh, all the fun stuff going on in politics right now. All right, Ross, nobody that I know is covering what's happening in New York the way that you are, especially with insight into what's going on for the left and what the implications are for the left. People who might have been following this, even though we haven't really talked about it much on Bad Faith Podcast, know that there was a pretty significant um, shakeup with respect to redistricting in New York this this year, which put some progressive seats at jeopardy and forced some interesting tee-offs this election season. Of course, the primaries were last night. We have the results. And now as we're recording Wednesday morning. So first, can you start us off by letting us know what happened with the re- redistricting and how did it affect uh, Mondaire Jones and some of these progressives in the race? So the redistricting saga in New York was really fascinating and chaotic. What happened was Democrats who now control the state legislature in New York fully, um, and this was actually, um, they, they didn't do this until 2019 for a host of reasons. So for the first time in more than a half century, Democrats controlled the redistricting process in New York entirely. So they wanted to draw Democrat-friendly districts, and they did that. The problem was they ran afoul of a anti gerrymandering uh, amendment passed in 2014. Um, there, there was also this in quasi-independent, but not really independent redistricting commission that was supposed to draw the lines. They failed to agree. Um, this was actually by design uh, because Andrew Cuomo, who was governor, designed this commission basically to fail. Um, but, but back then the hope was, you know, Republicans would then have a say in redistricting. Um, so Democrats, long story short, Democrats, drew maps, they drew House maps and state Senate and Assembly maps. They were thrown out by the courts, uh, the state's highest court threw them out, appointed a special master to very quickly draw new congressional and state Senate districts, and the special master did it. The districts were much more compact and competitive. They were less Democratic friendly, though from a good government perspective, they're pretty well drawn. The big thing that happened was the special master did not take into account incumbency at all. So you had longtime incumbents thrown together, Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney. Uh, Mondaire Jones ends up in a district with Jamal Bowman. Sean Patrick Maloney then is living in a district he didn't really represent all that much. Um, So it created a lot of this chaos and and kind of uh, musical chairs with who's running where. Um, A new district was created, the 10th Congressional District um, in New York City, which includes downtown Manhattan and um, northern Brooklyn, Brownstone, Brooklyn, and Sunset Park and Borough Park. This district was completely open with no incumbent at all. So there just was a very competitive primary to fill that seat. Jerry Nadler just defeated Carolyn Maloney um, in the district north of there. And then uh, Mondaire Jones ended up uh, to avoid a primary with Sean Patrick Maloney. um, He actually moved to Brooklyn to run for this new 10th seat and he did not win. And uh, I have argued this was a very bad political calculation on his part. So that's just the the short of it. And there's a lot more to unpack. So let's talk through the decision that Mondaire Jones faced. So first of all, Mondaire Jones, he's sometimes lumped in as you know, squad light, although, you know, didn't quite embrace that branding or wasn't tagged with that branding the way that some others did, uh, had, you know, had been tagged with it. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a little bit less of the uh, kind of stridency and ideological purity when it comes to issues like aid for Israel, for instance. I think a lot of the, even the progressives in New York State sometimes push back. We saw people very frustrated with Jamal Bowman for similar reasons and some votes that came down the pike earlier this year, but was broadly perceived as a progressive candidate. You said that he was, when the redistricting happened, he had the option to be A, in his original district with Jamal Bowman, another squad member, B, go up against uh, Sean Patrick Maloney, who that was, uh, he opted out of that because why? He's a a powerful Democrat. Yes. So the, the option to run against Maloney actually would have included a lot of the territory north of New York City and the suburbs that he represented in Congress. So it was, an, it was a new district, but Mondaire was familiar to a lot of the voters there. 
in essence, yes, Sean Patrick Maloney is the head of DCCC. He's a very uh, formidable fundraiser. He's an intimidating guy. He's very close with Pelosi and the leadership. And, and in fact, and he got Pelosi's endorsement. Yes, in, in so, that in that district. Mm-hmm. Yes, so so you know the, the squad. I think is more accommodating of House leadership than the reputation suggests, but they're also willing to buck leadership. Mondaire was someone who who is genuinely progressive, but he's also not someone who wants to go against the powerful players in D.C. And he made that very clear. He wanted to go on Nancy Pelosi's good side. Um, he was not really interested in running against Sean Patrick Maloney. According to reports, and I, I never confirmed this firsthand, but this was in The Intercept and other places, Mondaire looked very strongly at running against Jamal Bowman. And had the polling been better for him and his staff uh, supported it, he might have just run against Bowman. Um, but I think he decided the path of least resistance was to leave his leave where he lived, which is um, north of the city in Westchester County in White Plains, and, and he grew up in Rockland County, also north of the city, and come all the way down to Brooklyn to Carroll Gardens and run in this new open seat. He figured, well, it's an open seat. I'm a sitting congressman. I've got several million dollars to play with. I'll win. And it turned out to be a disastrous calculation. Um, from, I, from I understand he thought he would get a lot of endorsements that never materialized, like the Working Families Party, like local elected officials, Nidia Velasquez, even AOC. I think he thought the New York Times editorial board would come through and he had no roots in the district at all. So he couldn't really put it together and he never took off. And he pretty much finished where his polling, where the polling, public polling showed he would um, behind Dan Goldman, the winner, and also behind Julie New, who is sort of the favorite of um, a lot of the progressive voters and organizations. All right, I'm glad you brought both of them up because I want to talk about and flesh out what the what the other options in the race were. Dan Goldman has gotten some, you know, uh, got a significant boost in the form of a New York Times endorsement, which I understand many people did not necessarily expect. It seemed it seemed like too kind of uh, centrist a choice, even for the New York Times. And there were two other progressives, people of color, women in the race for this paper of record, the paper who very notably endorsed uh Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar in a a co-endorsement in the 2020 Democratic primary. It it was surprising for folks that they would go for this white male, more establishment candidate. To to what do you attribute that choice? So, yeah, I was surprised. You know, on on one hand, Dan Goldman is very much of the demographic that reads The Times. So he's a heir, you know, he's, he's worth as much as $250 million. He's an attorney. He went to Ivy League schools, you know, he worked on the Trump impeachment, you know, has been a cable TV presence for a while. So, you know, he checks all these kind of obvious times boxes. But yes, he's also a white man running in a district that had a lot of um, viable non-white um, candidates and female candidates as well. And, and the Times certainly in the past few years seems to be much more concerned about identity politics. And those kinds of appearances, like you mentioned, the Warren Klobuchar endorsement. So to go with the white man, the wealthy white man, you know, maybe 10 years ago, that's the type of thing the Times would have done more readily to go with him against the field that included Yuli New, Carlina Rivera, uh, Mondaire Jones, at least three candidates who um, either um, are are women or non-white. That was surprising. Um, Why did it happen? There's certainly speculation. There's been reporting that Goldman had ties to the Soulsburgers, um, who owned the Times. It's possible. I mean, we'll never truly know why the decision was made. If the editorial board itself got overridden by the publisher, that is their prerogative. They own the newspaper. Um, so, you know, the truth may never quite be known, but it does appear that Goldman's ties may have helped him, um, especially since if you read the endorsement, their rationale for supporting him seems a bit flimsy. Um, and, and actually, I don't know how much it, act, it helped power him to victory. I think the feeling was, well, it would it'll make him the viable front runner, but he almost lost. And it almost seemed like that the negative backlash generated from it probably helped you lean new. Um, and certainly um, Mondaire Jones spent aggressively against Goldman. He actually went on TV to attack Dan Goldman. So you did have that final week this kind of consolidation against Dan Goldman. It came just a little bit too late. Goldman had a little bit too much money, Um, but, you know, it it almost worked. Goldman did almost lose. The race was very close. 
And the Times, by the way, The Intercept covered this, um, uh, a story about the backlash the Times received for its endorsements. It wasn't just the Dan Goldman endorsement. It also chose Sean Maloney in District 17 and Jerry Nadler running against Carolyn Mal- uh, Maloney uh, in District 12. So across the board, it seemed to, you know, the the, vi- the visual, you know, we all, all have our critiques of identity politics here on the show, but the visual of having uh, picked these three uh, white men over the other candidates that were in the field did get them uh, some blowback. In addition to substantively, as as you have explained, the some of the endorsements seeming like they weren't especially confident or substantive in the way that they were written. Yeah, the only one that both wasn't a surprise and, and was probably defensible was Jerry Nadler. You know, Jerry Nadler against Carolyn Maloney, against Serge Patel, who we've run before. You know, Nadler did have a more progressive voting record. He opposed the Iraq war. He supported the Iran deal, which was very important for the Times editorial board. Um, so, you know, he's an Upper West Side institution. That one passable, understood. No one, no one cared. Yeah, also um, nobody's really crying a lot of crocodile tears for Kellen Maloney as some progressive feminist trailblazer. Right. Or anything. You know, I mean she's been more you know more of a more of a moderate. I mean her and Nadler are similar, but they diverge in these kind of very big, uh, big consequential votes. Sean Patrick Maloney definitely not a progressive, very much at the center of his party, very open about that. I I think in part the Times endorsed him because he was such a front runner. Um, the district also is in play for Republicans. It, it, it's, it's very much a competitive di- district in November. So the Times, when they endorsed Maloney, it was also very lukewarm. They basically said, well, you know, he can, he can hold the seat, but, you know, might be true. Um, but yes, you know, Sean Patrick Maloney is someone who, um, you know, has alienated the left for many years. He's fought with Democrats in his own district. He once ran for state attorney general in New York, pretty much to be a spoiler candidate against the progressive choice Zephyr teach out and he was running on behalf behest of Andrew Cuomo who he's very close to he benefited from heavy spending from the New York City police union because they they don't like Biagi for being progressive on a criminal mm-hmm. justice reform so Maloney was very much like a, a classic villain for the left and I think rightfully so but the times in that case just didn't want to go out on a limb and support someone who probably wasn't going to win and, and Biagi didn't really have a path to victory and so I, I, my sense of the times just went with Maloney because he was going to win. Whereas with Goldman, that was less defensible. I mean, that race was very much in play, didn't have a true front runner. Goldman was slightly ahead, but um, could have easily endorsed a different candidate. I, I thought maybe they'd go with Carlina Rivera, Latina city councilwoman, who's a, who's a center left candidate, um, if not new. Um, you know, they seem to be inching toward Mondaire, but my sense is the fact that he just so blatantly carpet bagged out of the suburbs into Brooklyn, probably. Did. Yeah, that narrative is so interesting to me because obviously in the back of a lot of people's minds are going to be any number of carpet bag races, but specifically this Dr. Oz uh, debacle with uh, Fetterman. And it strikes me as somewhat different. You know, Dr. Oz is contending with being... Oprah's health guy being someone who I think probably lived as a liberal in many of our heads until yeah. the last few years and has to kind of uh, rehabilitate himself as someone who was completely, uh, completely different, not just because he's out of town, but because he's out of it. He's in a different kind of socioeconomic class as someone like Fetterman, whereas New York, this new 10th district it's a pretty Tony district as far as districts go. It's hard to imagine more affluence concentrated in one place. It comprises much of the West Village. Uh, Jerry Nadler, correct me if I'm wrong, because I used to live in what would now be the 10th. And mm-hmm. I feel like Jerry Nadler was my representative. His yes, district used was. to accomplish Jerry, that. Jerry Nadler is somewhat to blame here because he he could have just ran in the 10th and won easily. and You would never have had this whole problem. Um, but Nadler, he lives on the Upper West Side and he didn't want to run in a district he didn't live in. The legally, he can do <laughs> he didn't it. want to move downtown. He didn't want to move downtown. West. Basically, didn't want to move downtown, thought he could win the 12th and he was right. Um, um, but yes, downtown Manhattan was Jerry Nadler's terrain for decades. Um, yeah. So not that part of Brooklyn, but the, the Manhattan portion very much. And he would have cleared the field. No one would have run against him. So the idea that, you know, a guy, a guy from Westchester like Mondaire Jones is like so out of step to be in, you know, downtown Manhattan. I mean, everybody from downtown Manhattan and the group of Westchester. <laughs> yeah, 
no, yeah. far, even farther I, afield. I, I think the issue wasn't that he was out of step. The issue is that he just wasn't known in the district. Mm. So when I say, you know, he made a bad calculation, he was a one term congressman establishing himself north of the city and then hopped very blatantly into um, a district that was nowhere near where he was. I don't think there are people in the streets going, oh, Mondaire, how dare you? I, I really don't. Like you said, I mean, New York, it's a cosmopolitan place. Everyone is from somewhere else. I'm one of the few people I knew, know who grew up in Brooklyn and still like live there. Most people I know and friends grew up elsewhere. Um, so that's totally acceptable. I mean, the, the Bill de Blasio grew up in Massachusetts, was mayor. Michael Bloomberg grew up in Massachusetts and, and became mayor. Happens all the time. Mm -hmm. The issue for Mondaire, and I said this from the outset, he had to work very hard to build his name wreck in this new district. I think he made the mistake uh, somewhat of a, of a mistake of hubris, which was assuming I have a big Twitter following. Um, I'm popular with the progressive organizations, the NGOs, right? Um, the squad likes me enough. You know, he's a young guy. You know, he's, he's a nice looking guy. You know, he presents very well. You know, he, he's very good on television. I mean, he, he has everything. There's a reason he won. Black and gay and Black with and a Harvard gay. pedigree right. that he people checks, like. There are boxes yeah. being checked left and right. And he's genuinely impressive. Like, I, I've seen Monmere in person. I, I've met him. I mean, he, he's, 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 he's really good. And he won his race in 2020 going away. I mean, that was, that was, a, that was a competitive primary. Nita Lowy had held that Westchester seat for decades. And there were all of these like well-heeled people like desperate to take it. And Mondaire just blew the field out of the water. He was only 33 years old. So I get all that. But then I think he assumed because of that whole package, he could just come into a new district and he'd be fine. And, and he didn't really do a lot of press. You know, I was critical of him in terms of, but he didn't really seem to be doing a lot of interviews with local reporters, myself included. Um, he didn't seem to be on the ground that much. I mean, not that many campaign events, um, not out and about, you know, again, didn't really have a good rationale for being in the race. And I, I think it wasn't that voters said, you know, how dare a Westchester person come here. I really think it was, they didn't know who he was. I mean, I, I used an example of even my parents who, they don't live in New York 10, but they live close, close by just south of there. And, you know, they watch MSNBC and CNN all the time. They're, they read the Times every day. They're, they're pretty astute. They didn't know who Mondaire Jones was. They, they had yeah. no idea. I mean, they just didn't. He's a one-term congressman. They know Pelosi. They know Schumer. You know, they know Adam Schiff, right? The, mm -hmm. There are famous members of Congress, and, and Mondaire wasn't quite in that terrain yet. So if you're going to move and go do this, you've got to come out there and run very, very aggressively. You've got to run like you're behind. My sense is he ran like he was ahead and yeah. didn't work. Yeah, it's interesting. I, so full disclosure, I went to law school with Mondaire. I think it was a year, oh. maybe two years behind me. Um, awesome. yeah. I just, I mean, we weren't, you know, close, but I liked him and we were friendly. There were only so many black kids around, you know? So I, I, I fall, I've been watching him and I know that I have reached out, you know, kind of informally to see if he was interested in doing media. Cause he has been occupying this kind of weird liminal space uh, from my observation where he's not really leaning into the, the leftist branding. He certainly isn't. And, and none of them really are doing a lot of left media, even when it could be an opportunity for him, as you've pointed out. And I do think it's a shame because he was a kind of a blank slate who could have chosen a lot of different types. of. For writing. the record, I was trying to get him for a print piece in New York magazine. I mean, that, that was it was a very strange saga, which I guess I can tell now where um, my editor said to me, hey, Mondaire is really interesting. You know, we do this. It's called an encounter. Basically, they run every couple the paper the magazine prints every other week. Uh, they run like a, a short profile of a, of a significant person. So I did one of Pete Buttigieg a few months ago and they wanted to do Mondaire. And I reached out to the campaign. It was, this is like May. And it's like, well, he, he did Washington a lot, but he's busy. I said, that's fine. Let's just pick a date, May or June. Let's get it done. I mean, I, again, I had no problem getting any other candidate. I interviewed Bill de Blasio for an hour. It, it, it just didn't get done. It, it, it was very huh. strange. Like I said, I, I did this Buttigieg, you know, um, I've interviewed, you know, baseball players. I've, I've interviewed important people in my life. Um, they could not get me a half hour with Mondaire Jones in the district for a print piece for a mainstream left of center publication. Yeah. Right. Oof. And it was just, it was odd. I'm like, this is an opportunity. You're in a 10 person race. You got it. All the press counts. Everything, everything matters. Right. 
Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know if my experience was indicative, but I, I just noticed in general, I didn't see that many interviews. He did one with my friend, Dan Rant at the HuffPost. You know, Dan's really good. Um, outside of that, I, and I think the times he spoke with once and some like general overview of the race, I just didn't see him in the media that much. And I'm like, well, you, you gotta be out there, especially in the New York market. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities to do stuff and, and to be didn't. running to be running in the West Village in Chelsea, I'm sorry, and not to to I mean most of the people who voted probably didn't even know that there was a gay candidate running. It just it feels so it's just there seem like a lot of opportunities to distinguish yourself and to let people know who you are and to appeal ev- even if only superficially to the district that you're running in. And it does feel like a lot of missed opportunities. We'll see. Look, we'll see. Maybe none of the dust has settled. Maybe he'll do an interview with you. Maybe he'll come on Bad bad Faith and we he can should. catch I mean, up and reminisce about a, the good old days. <laughs> he's going to need a new job or I mean, he'll, he'll get a job. But certainly if he wants to have a political future. Yeah. I mean, it, it's fascinating. Like, I, I think I use an example of Buttigieg again, and probably no one on Bad Faith likes Buttigieg. But, <laughs> you know, the, the Liz Smith Buttigieg example is right. instructive when he was running for president. There was no press he turned down. He did every podcast. He did every, most like alternative outlets, you know, mainstream. She just threw him out there. And, you know, that strategy doesn't always work, but especially if you're an underdog. And you need a candidate who I think is is kind of quick enough and smart enough on their feet to be able to handle tough questions and not get a gap. And I think that Mondaire is that Mon- kind oh, of candidate. Absolutely. And that's the thing with Mondaire. I'm like, you should be exposing him more. I mean, yeah, because you, you hear him when you put him in front of people. You're like, yeah, no, he, he seems really good. You know, I, I saw him at a press conference with Julie New. I thought he certainly I, I was impressed. Um so, so it was very odd. I don't know if it was his choice, his campaign's choice. I mean, mm. the, the whole the whole thing, I think, from start to finish was not well done. And it's a shame because, yeah, Mondaire, he's not squad or he's not socialist. But, you know, in the spectrum of, of members of Congress, if you're someone on the left, you want more Mondaire Joneses in Congress. If the Congress had a lot more Mondaires, it would be a more progressive Congress. So you're losing that now. And it didn't have to be that way, or he could have run against Maloney, had a decent shot. Even if he lost, I think for his own future, he would have been set up to have other, other opportunities because that that really would have been a race where he was running a cause campaign, you know, almost, I don't want to say martyr, because I think he would have had a shot to win, but um, that's the sort of race, even if you lose, the upsides are big. You're the guy who took on the head of the DCCC, Let's say you got 45%. You, you almost got there. And now, who knows, right? There's always seats are popping up and wherever you are and you stay busy and active, you find your way. Now it's like, I mean, he's the guy right now, at least if you hang out on Twitter, who is despised for taking votes from really new. I mean, that's if the online left is just cancel on their well, Let's, let's right talk now. about that. Why is it that the left <laughs> aligned ultimately behind Yuli New? To, yeah. to be clear, Dan Goldman um, won with 25.8% of the vote, about uh, oh, 16,686 votes. Yulene came in with uh, 23.7% of the vote, and Mondaire ended up with 18.2% of the vote. So very clearly, if either Yulene or Mondaire hadn't run, they, the progressive option, would have run away with this thing. Um, and earlier on, it seemed like Yulene and Mondaire were even closer than that, although Yulene always uh, the whole time ahead. How did that happen? Because I, I got to say, I'm not familiar with her and didn't really come to know who she was until following this race. She's, she's really interesting. Um, I can give a Yuli new primer. Um, Please. I'd say with Mondaire, I, I, I thought, you know, again, in a vacuum, if Mondaire had not moved from a different district and, you know, made the mistakes he made, he would have been a great fit for New York 10. And that's why I think he thought about it is because I actually think Mondaire got votes I'm guessing, and I have to look at the numbers. I haven't dug in deep. My guess is Mondaire Jones got votes that would maybe not have voted for you. We knew that these are, you know, he probably got votes from professional class people, maybe center left people who are like, wow, he's a lawyer. You know, he's really smart. He's good on TV. Like, I like him, even if he brands progressive. I think that was like a strength for Mondaire as a politician in general is he could bridge build between like the the sort of activist left and, and then the more, I'd say center left, you know, upper crust type people. It's how he won in Westchester. Again, going away, and he had to win a lot of voters who would not be into AOC or into left politics in general. And they, they chose him, and he mostly stuck to his principles. Um, so Yuli News is interesting. You know, she's someone who definitely is is 
is, um, you know, was a progressive in the state assembly. Uh, he, she's very outspoken against Andrew Cuomo, you know, was aligned with DSA on issues, though not a member of DSA. And it's important to stress that. I would say for, for and I, I can I can talk this way, you know, on this podcast, people know what I'm talking about, but she's more of a Warren than she was a Warren Democrat, not, not a Bernie Democrat. She supported Warren in the 2020 election, not Bernie. She's a sort of NGO left, left liberal Democrat, not a Bernie person. Yes, Ross, but, you definitely know your audience. <laughs> but I'd say, but the but is she is very good at branding herself. Mm. And she definitely branded in a way where she appealed to the Bernie left as well. And I think people who are very enthusiastic about AOC and the squad. So while she was not with them in the 2020 fight at all, um, and generally I think her politics are much more identity centric than like a DSA or a Bernie. She, because she's a pretty good communicator and she is good at Twitter. um, She very successfully got the lane in in, in this race. She got the brand. She got the lane. Mondaire couldn't quite get it. Um, I think did she get the endorsements. Issue. She got WFP. She did not get AOC. AOC stayed out, but she got WFP, so that helped. And she Why got do a you lot. Think of that shirts. is because you said Mondaire was expecting to get that WFP endorsement. Why do you think they went with Eileen? You know, I think longstanding ties. I I think I think Mondaire thought you know by moving that would be one of the big gets. I I, I do think Yulene, being an elected official in the district, had ties to the organization. Mondaire um, didn't have in, within New York City. My my guess is too maybe they saw Yulene as viable at the beginning, which she was. Um, you know, she, I mean, she allegedly just won the chapter vote. I mean, WFP is a weird organization, as you know, from working the Bernie campaign. Bernie won the rank and file vote, it seemed like, by plenty. And then they just said, nope, we're supporting Warren. So I, I got into trouble on Twitter just today uh, criticizing the WFP endorsement process, and I'll keep doing that. Um, but, but it seems like here, there, this was like vaguely more democratic, where the rank and file liked you lean more. They saw her as a genuine progressive and, and she's in a district. She's a lower Manhattan assembly woman. And that does matter. She had coalitions there ready to go. Um, and she fundraised decently. Mondaire came in with more money, but she wasn't a slouch either. Um, so, so, yeah. Do, uh, do you think there was at any point a conversation between the two progressive camps about one of them, obviously, from the results, Mondaire was the obvious choice. Yeah. Stepping down. I, I, I think no, because there was no obvious way to do it. You had a wide open race, right? Remember this race has no incumbent. Um, polling was there, but it was sparse and polling would show Goldman ahead, Mondaire in third, you know, Yulene in second, Carlina in third. It just, there wasn't a lot of data there not enough of it. And each of them could argue, I have a path to victory, right? And, and that's that's the issue. So um, Mondaire could say, I have several million dollars in the bank and I'm on TV. Are you on TV? No. Yulene could say, well, I'm polling better than you and I have a base in the district and I can win. You know, Carlina Rivera ran more as a center-left candidate, so I don't think she was naturally a fit. She was endorsed by Nidia Velasquez, um, and the biggest labor union in the state, 1199 SEIU. So she mm-hmm. wasn't going to exit either. She had a coalition behind her. So, you know, these races, they're, they're complicated. I also don't think the votes divide off that neatly. I do think Goldman, with less candidates in the field, probably loses. I do agree with people. But I also, again, I said this before, I'm not convinced that the Carlina Rivera voter or the Mondaire Jones voter automatically goes to Yuli New. I mean, mm. Yuli New branded herself very much as like unabashed, like online progressive, you know, um, confrontation, you know, confrontational to an extent, like identity first. I think there, there's a there's a segment in that district that loves it. There's a segment in that district probably, you know, more towards the center, but even maybe sort of a, a Bernie tinge that is turned off by it. So mm. um, I, I think she would have been, if Mondaire was never there, I think, yes, Yuli wins or likely wins. I also think votes don't always divide up so neatly in that way. So it can be hard for candidates in a situation like that to make that decision. And that's when you think you're going to win. So Ross, uh, 
what was going on with that messy little uh, sideshow about Yulene saying that she had, uh, you know, there was some confusion about who she actually endorsed in the mayoral race. I saw some scuttlebutt on Twitter about this. It seemed like a late emerging, you know, petit scandale. Like a day, a day of story. Yeah. So basically what happened was in the mayor's race last year, um, the the sort of the candidate who's consolidating the progressive organizations and kind of like the center left in the field with Scott Stringer, the city controller, you know, more uh, not, he was not like someone kind of up the grassroots left, but, you know, was a longtime elected official who had very painstakingly built relationships with you. We knew with Julia Salazar, who at the time was the only DSA member in the state Senate with a lot of these interest groups, the WFP, right? So Stringer has a, has a me too scandal. This woman comes out, and says Scott Stringer sexually assaulted me. I think it was like in the early 2000s. Um, you know, it, it was a complicated scandal in that it was a very long time ago and it was very much a he said, she said kind of thing. And they were complicated by the fact that they had dated in the past. They had that dated had the past. Yes, that she had they, kind of framed the story like she was a very young intern when it happened. Yes, and, and it turns like out that wasn't the case. 30s. Yeah, right. it, it was murky. It was a very murky thing. And I think in retrospect, um, the, the progressive interest groups, even the press could have handled it differently or, or better. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the political outcome was Stringer stock tanked almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Another candidate who is less progressive, Catherine Garcia, got the New York Times endorsement, basically took from his coalition and rose as he sunk. So, you know, Yuli knew had endorsed Scott Stringer. Um, claimed though that she voted for Maya Wiley, who mm-hmm. became once Stringer collapsed, the choice of progressive, certainly of the center left. Of and WFP. also after the what quote unquote real progressive candidate, Diane Morales, she had kind of blew up in yes. flames after her own uh, campaign kind of rebelled on her and accused her of yes. not treating staff or paying staff properly. Yes. So, so Morales was a mess. Stringer had his problems. Maya Wiley is the de facto choice. Maya Wiley, you know, a, a former de Blasio administration lawyer and MSNBC analyst, you know, mm-hmm. not, not exactly a progressive diehard, you know, in the real sense. But big, she kind big of, Warren kind of vibes. Yes, very much so. Energy. Very mm-hmm. not a not a Bernie person at all. Probably hates Bernie tremendously. She became the de facto choice of all these kind of left people. Like, all right, well, we've got to vote for her. Can't vote for Garcia. Cannot vote for Eric Adams. Cannot vote for Andrew Yang. Right. So Yuli New claims that she voted for Maya Wiley. That was her public claim because Stringer melted down. Stringer apparently had a picture of her ballot that Yuli sent to Stringer um, or her sent to someone. I mean, Stringer had it that showed that she bubbled in Scott first. So <laughs> Scott had these receipts. Yulene was caught red-handed. She said it wasn't actually her ballot. I don't believe her. Um, so that was like the the late breaking weird scandal. I don't think it impacted the race at all, but it was certainly Why amusing. Why would you lie about? Like, who was that for? I don't know. <laughs> I think she didn't want to be caught as, as saying, oh, I support Scott Stringer, the white male sexual harasser. Um, and like I support the, the, the good candidate, Maya Wiley. Um, and I think she didn't expect that Stringer would have this image, I guess. Um, so that's, she got caught in a lie. But, that's you know. So, that's so bizarre. I mean, that being the only piece of information I really knew about her. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, don't know exactly where that new, puts her in my brain. Is, yeah, new is complicated. Like, like I said, she, she had a little bit, I, I'd say she's a bit more of like a, a, a politically talented Maya Wiley, if I use the analogy, where... There are people in DSA and there, there are DSA people in office who are not the biggest fans of Yuli New, who kind of view her as, you know, again, like very identity focused, sort of more of like building her own brand, um, you know, someone who's who's votes the right way, but is not kind of part of this greater left, certainly socialist movement in New mm. York. So mm. she's kind of outside of all of that, you know, um, but again, she is a talented politician. She ran a good race. She is good online. And that, that stuff in a district like this does matter. And she very, I think, cannily was able to consolidate this lane where the average kind of left-leaning person under 45 in this district was just voting for her. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, she's a progressive. Well, she supports Medicare for all, the Green New Deal. It's all over her campaign. Lit. And I think she's, I'm not saying she's not earnest about supporting those things. I think she is. Uh, but just the point that, she got the lane, right? A lot of this stuff sometimes comes down to branding and what lane can you seize. And 
she very successfully did it and almost won. So I got to ask you, Jerry Nadler really cleared the lane, kind of, you know, was beat Caroline Maloney with no problem. Yeah. Were you surprised by that? A little bit. Yeah. I was surprised by how decisive it was. Yes. I mean, I, I wrote a piece about that race um, for New York magazine uh, a few weeks ago. And, you know, the way I framed it was, you know, Nadler is maybe the favorite, but, you know, Maloney's a serious candidate. Maloney's won tough races before. She'd survived two recent primary challenges. Um, and, and she's in better physical shape. Like she, she was more capable of campaigning and getting around the district than Nadler was. Um, so I was surprised by how decisively Nadler won. If you told me Nadler was going to win by dominating the West side and cutting into the East side, I'd say, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, but winning, you know, breaking 50%, really throttling the competition. Um, that did surprise me a bit, but I think, I think his campaign did a good job. You know, he wasn't out that much, but I think his campaign, the message, well, they kind of emphasized his voting record. Um, he got the endorsements he needed. He got the times. He got Chuck Schumer, which I think was a surprise to people, but he and Schumer go way back. And that all mattered. And Maloney herself was much more flawed as a candidate. She had her issues with, um, you know, questioning the safety of uh, vaccines, non-COVID vaccines. She had kind of this long running flirtation really? with, do vaccines cause autism? Yeah, she had like requested studies and, spoken at hearings and so she, she was never like anti-vax truly but there was a like kind of a paper trail of her um flirting with this fringe for a, a while oh you that's know, she, fascinating and did, did Nadler use that was that out in like ads or it, Patel the third candidate absolutely did so Patel had run against her twice already and he kind of ran as he used to be more of like a progressive vaguely squad-esque challenger who morphed into I'm an Obama Democrat, you mm-hmm. know, la- labels don't matter kind of kind of guy. But yes, he hammered her very extensively. I think he did a television ad around it. He very aggressively took her on on that issue. Um, you know, I, I think Maloney sometimes had the had the image of a non-serious lawmaker, though she she was serious. She had this long running obsession with pandas and bringing a panda to New York City. Oh, I, wish, hey, I, wish, I wish I was kidding. <laughs> You can you can Google it, Google Carolyn Maloney pandas, and you can find New York Times stories about it. Uh, the Post. She for years has been very open about her love of pandas and trying to get one from China into the Central Park Zoo or something like that. <laughs> New York Post from twenty three hours ago: Carolyn Maloney's panda quest could end Democratic primary loss. What? She's had a long time panda quest, which again, you know, if you're in races where you're the heavy favorite, you can be a panda lawmaker. But then when you're up against Jerry Nadler, the voters may be like, wait, so you're the panda lady. What's going on here? Um, so I think, she, yeah, I think there's a confluence of this stuff that definitely hurt her. Um, I think the vaccine stuff definitely hurt her in that district. I think Nadler too had kind of this consistent, center left progressive record that he just ran on and he got the endorsements he needed the coalitions he needed and his side of the district also had more votes the west side votes more than the east side it's got more democrats so he was always in good position but he really ran away with it she never got onto his turf at all and then he got into her turf a little bit I mean, that's fascinating because, I mean, she has to have been in, in Congress. I mean, she was my representative in high school. So Yeah, they both they entered at the same time. They both started in, in 93. So they, they served together since the early 90s, side by side. And then they were thrown together. It's very Shakespearean. And one it, person had it, to It was very surprising to me. Like, I understand someone like Mondaire Jones, a newbie, a progressive, being, you know, inconvenienced by the redistricting. The story of the redistricting to me really was the story, given that it was threatening, you know, threatening one of two really serious, longtime mm-hmm. establishment Democrat, mm-hmm. Democratic in- incumbents. Yes. And I, the, the redistricting process was a mess. But I, I will say the court appointed special master drew very logical, very compact districts. And it would have been nice if we just had that true independent process from the get-go. You'd have to go through like rounds of court challenges and, and weird, you know, 
confusion. I mean, New York this year had like three, two or three different congressional maps. Like it was crazy. We had split primary dates, which was also really stupid. We had a June primary for governor and state assembly and an August primary for state Senate and Congress. So the turnout was a mess, Mm. bad process. But that being said, I, I give credit to this court appointed special master who did what a true independent a drawer of maps does, you don't factor in incumbency. You draw districts that unite communities and are compact. And this Manhattan district, look at the map of it, it's basically a square that yeah. runs from like the top of Central Park, a little more down to Greenwich Village, east side, west side. And the, the special master said, I don't really care about Loney <laughs> and Jerry Nasser's careers. You know, what you guys fight it out and, and figure it out. The 10th district too, pretty compact downtown Manhattan into Brooklyn terminates around um, where I live, uh, Bay Ridge, you know, the, the districts, they look nice. I mean, they're, they're drawn the way probably districts yeah, should be drawn. I, I'm questioning less the, the, the special master, but the idea that the Democrats instigated this process, hoping yeah, they to, screwed it up. you know, like make, you know, make it harder for Republicans to get in office in the state. It, but ultimately, I mean, do you think that if they knew that this was the outcome, they would have even instigated this to begin with? Because it's it an actually, like, it's this an, is the kind of thing that powerful people like Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler let happen to them. It's an excellent question, and no one's given me a good answer. And I, and I wish I wasn't an attorney or election lawyer because I could really study it more effectively. Mm-hmm. Because from what I understand, all the Democrats in the state just had no idea they could lose a court challenge. And that and it, was, it was, in retrospect, the hubris was striking in that from the the leaders in the state Senate, from the members of the House delegation who were involved, Hakeem Jeffries on down, this collective like democratic, you know, cohort was like, legally, we are allowed to draw our lines as we see fit. And there, this, you know, the way we do it is fine. We're not gonna run afoul of this constitutional amendment passed in 2014, it'll be fine. And honestly, as a journalist, I mean, in retrospect, I swallowed that line. You know, my, my coverage was not, I think, skeptical enough of the reality starting last year that, hey, th- th- they could fail, that this could get a court challenge. Now, the first court challenge was in a conservative Republican court upstate. So when the Democrats lost there, it's like, OK. And of course, Republicans challenged this in court. That's who brought the challenge. Mm-hmm. So very partisan, right? Mm. So they, they lose with a kind of, with a right-wing judge upstate. It's like, all right, they lost. Then they lose again. Then it gets the court of appeals, the highest court in New York state, which actually is, is, is fairly conservative itself because Cuomo appointed most of the judges, but they lose there too. And I think very few thought they'd lose at the court of appeals level, the New York's equivalent of the Supreme Court. And that was it. And it was blown up overnight. I mean, it's literal chaos. You had people preparing to run in districts that just did not exist anymore. Biagi, who ran against Sean Patrick Maloney, she had been campaigning in an entirely different district that included the North Shore of Long Island and the Bronx and Westchester. Mm-hmm. So she herself <laughs> ran into a new district. Um, so the process was terrible. Uh, and, and no, I mean, Nadler and Maloney, too, I mean, they never thought this would happen. They did not think the lines would be thrown out in court. And then the special master, you know, who's a, a redistricting expert, a pretty young guy in his thirties would sit down on his own, basically. Though he took input, there were some hearings, not many, and, and sketched these new, new maps. Um, I think no one saw it coming. Mm-hmm. And then it happened and it's like, well, that's it. Got to run. And that's what just happened. That was this whole saga of August. with <laughs> all these Democrats fighting these districts. Yeah, well, look, I guess the last one we got to ask you about, I know it was a blowout, but Biagi, I, I didn't feel, so for one is the question of whether or not Mondaire should have been in that race. If he had been, whether or not there would have been some, col- some consolidation among progressives or people would have still been mad at uh, Mondaire because they might might have felt like Biagi was more entitled. But what, what happened here? Because I didn't feel... I didn't hear, not that I'm like the be all end all of, you know, media consumption, but I'm a relatively plugged in person and I didn't feel a lot of progressive energy or online attention being paid to to that particular race 
or the idea that this was this could be a, a quote unquote progressive victory the way we were all rooting for various races after the sweep in 2018. Yeah, no, Biagi never captured, I agree, that energy. She had the endorsement. She got the AOC WFP combo, which you always want. Um, but yeah, never quite materialized. I think some of it is she herself didn't really have roots in the district. I mean, she, she has a house in Westchester, but you know, she her state senate district was really mostly in the Bronx. So yeah, the, the narrative for her there wasn't the best. Um, sometimes I wonder if being a sitting elected official doesn't always help your narrative. And she was a pretty progressive state senator. I think to her credit, Biagi, she, she really was. And she challenged Cuomo and I give her a lot of credit, like you lean new too. Um, but, you know, AOC, you know, 28 year old bartender taking on Joe Crowley. Um, maybe there's something about, you know, 36 year old state senator running against Sean Patrick Maloney. It doesn't like captivate in the same way. Hey, 36 right? is still plenty young, Ross. It is. I'm 32 <laughs> and I'm, I feel, I've, I've, I've aged out of being a young millennial completely. I agree. 36 for politics is quite young. Um, but it's like, there's this, like, there's this weird political fascination of like with progressives. They're not, not always obviously Bernie in the other extreme, like this, like Gen Z kid, Maxwell Frost, right? Who just won. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always like this like weird allure if they're under 30. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Yeah, Biagi, she didn't capture it. I agree. Um, maybe it was the feeling that Maloney was too strong. Um, I think Maloney, unlike Crowley, was not a lazy incumbent. You know, he'd won swing races before. Um, he had a lot of money. Um, and uh, it was also a swing district. I don't know if that plays into it, but you know, you're running in a primary to then have to compete in a pretty tough general. I don't know if that narrative is complicated. Whereas if you're running, like Yuli knew, you know, she wins, that's it. She's the Congresswoman, right? Here it's like Biagi could win and then just lose to a Republican. I mean, Maloney could lose to a Republican. It's, it's like a Biden plus three district. I do think Roe v. Wade is changing things. You're, you mm -hmm. saw that in another swing district that the Democrat Pat Ryan just won. But regardless, you're talking about a very competitive general. Biagi, just, it, it didn't quite click in, um, I think, with progressives. And you know, I mean, she she's a she is a good. She's interesting too, Biagi. I say her her narrative. I mean, she was in, high up in the Clinton campaign in 2016, and then worked for Cuomo, but very much evolved into like the, she endorsed Warren in 2020 as well. But she in Albany evolved into very much like a hard charging progressive, like not a moderate in any way. So she she's someone who also came came out of sort of this very like centrist establishment world, but didn't uh, didn't was not a, a senator in that way, but couldn't couldn't quite connect. And Maloney was just such a heavy favorite, and he won. Well, Ross, when you step back and look at all of the primaries you've had so far and, you know, just last night across the, the country, people are now talking about the fact that, you know, the, the Democrats might accidentally not fail as hard as people have been <laughs> predicting they might, if only because Democrats tend to lose seats uh, when there's an incumbent in the White House. And, you know, people are saying, well, the Democrats, it's, it's like the, the dog that actually catches its tail might not know what to do with it. Do you think that's a real risk that Democrats are going to have to come up with an actual policy agenda if they do, in fact, pick up a few, you know, if they hold the House and pick up some seats in the Senate? Um, you know, are they going to have to recalibrate after two years of basically saying we can't do anything because of Joe Manchin and cinema in a way that many people on the left think is convenient and not, in fact, correlated to a you know, real frustration with an ability yeah. to pass an agenda. I, I think that, yes, the Democrats are not expecting to have to come up with a policy agenda next year because the assumption was it's two years and out. That's how it was with Obama. Trump was the same way. It was, it was two years of full control of government, and then it was over. I, I think, yes, the, the feeling was you know, the 50-50 Senate, get the reconciliation bills done, get what we can, and, and that'll be that. Um, I, I, I don't think, you know, Schumer or Biden or anyone is thinking about, wow, in 2023, we, we may have room to operate here. Uh, I don't think it's entered their minds. You know, the dog caught the car analogy, you know, it really re applies to the Republicans. I think for, for once, you know, I, and you and many others, you know, always lash, you know, establishment Democrats and, and the party for its various failures, communications failures, policy failures, you go up and down the list. But I think sometimes we forget I mean, the Republican Party, 
fucks up politically too. I mean, they, they can be very alienating. This whole Roe v. Wade thing, I mean, this is like the dog caught the car. I mean, if you ask Mitch McConnell, I'm sure privately, he would say, I hope they don't overturn Roe v. Wade. I mean, mm-hmm. what, a, what a disaster this is going to be for us, right? How great was it for Republicans to campaign for years and years on restricting abortion access, uh, but but doing it in such a way where the, the Democratic base would never be motivated because the idea of the Supreme Court repealing it seemed far-fetched. And you couldn't tell the average voter, I'm running to protect a woman's right to choose because one day Roe v. Wade will fall. They'll say, well, it hasn't happened yet. Right. Call me when it happens. Then it happened. And now you see it's like such a, I mean, it's, it's horrible for the country, but it's like this insane political gift to the Democrats where Republicans should be having this like great midterm environment. The economy is, is, is okay, but not tremendous. You have inflation as a very real concern. You have the normal doldrums. I mean, Biden's deeply unpopular. You know, he's maybe senile. He, he can't communicate. Right. And yet here we are. And the Republicans might lose seats in the Senate. You know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy. And I do think, you know, abortion has played a huge role in that bad candidate recruitment for the Republicans. I think that's also a thing where for once the establishment Dems or, you know, center left Dems generally are now fielding pretty good candidates in these swing seats. You know, candidates who I think have like John Fetterman or Mandela Barnes, some progressive bona fide. Uh, while also, you know, kind of being able to appeal to a general electorate, um, you know, and the Republicans are feeling terrible candidates. So the question is, yeah, they're Democrats thinking about, wow, like we can govern more in 2023. I don't think it's on their agenda at all. And that's a good, I mean, it'd be good if uh, that happens because then maybe you could see progress on the stuff that didn't get done. Right. I mean, for me, it's healthcare, healthcare system is still terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the IRA was successful and did a lot of good things, but, you know, nothing on healthcare, you know, even the public option, which used to be the compromise move. We're not even seeing action on that. So it would be good to do something. Robbie on the Hill has been talking a lot about how the Republicans are getting a little bit nervous. Uh, and it is interesting to see them, you know, it, it, it sometimes feels can feel like when you're on, on the left, the Republicans are invincible, that nothing sticks to them. We just came through this Trump era where he had this ability to uh, move so quickly through, you know, kind of uh, actions and statements that were perceived to be offensive, that nothing seemed to stick. His refusal to apologize for anything, I think, was a, a certain kind of mad genius where you know, what can you really do if someone can't be held accountable or be shamed into anything? Nothing. And so they just move through the world. And so now you have all of these candidates who are behaving similarly. We live in this kind of Trump DeSantis world where we all know the extent to which critical race theory and whatever uh, some trans golfers doing somewhere in America are these galvanizing uh, uh, principles on which people are being driven to the polls. And yet now we're seeing some cracks and there does seem to be some limit to the extent to which the, the the country is willing to get on board with this. And I watched, I saw this clip, and I'm going to play it for you really quickly, the short clip from Laura Ingram, where she is sounding like so many Democrats, so many centrists, mm. like the Hillary Clinton types, who've been like, come on, guys, what are you complaining about? Just be nice to the, the candidates. Get, get to the <laughs> polls. Like, don't don't look to, look a gift horse in the mouth. Here, let me, let me show you this. Yeah, let me see this. So instead of complaining about our candidates or kind of being wishy-washy on them, we should recognize that this group is actually great. Our nominees, with a few exceptions, like Colorado, are political newcomers. They haven't had a lot of experience, but that's okay. They're out there fighting for the average person. They should be respected for getting in the ring. I like that. No, it it is a very, it's funny. Yeah, it is like the way the left used to be chastised, I feel like from 2016 to 2020. I mean, the thing with the Republican Party is, you know, how am I going to say this? Democrats, I think, in 2020 clearly went down weird rabbit holes on, like, culture and identity, right? I mean, I I think this is what made Bernie so successful is, you know, Bernie was a leftist who understood you have to talk to people who are not left-wing. Like, that. Mm -hmm. I think think that the 2016 Bernie, to accept the 2020 Bernie, he's someone who came out of Vermont that was once a swing state and isn't one anymore. And it's like, you know, I, I, you got to talk to these people, right? There's people who don't agree with you and you got to win them over. And, and de- Democrats, it felt like 
in that 2020 period forgot that, you know, took on kind of alienating stances on, on culture and education, on policing even. And, and Republicans got a gift, right? The whole 2021 cycle was about how Democrats were, gen- I think, genuinely bad on like COVID and schools. I mean, I would get in trouble for saying it's, it's good to have schools open and they're important. They used to be a progressive position that public schools matter and, and should have kids in them. But, you know, the Republicans like actually won the education issue in 2021, which is like unprecedented, right? Because mm-hmm. Republicans are terrible in education, mm-hmm. always have been. And then it's like, you know, 2022 felt like more of the same, you know, then, then inflation becomes an issue and, you know, the Biden had achievements, but he's like such a bad communicator. And like that White House doesn't like know how to sell anything. And it's just like more of the same, more of the same. And then and Roe v. Wade happens. I think that that opens up a huge window. But also, I, I think, um, you know, I, what you said about Democrats think your Republicans are invincible, like they're not invincible, you know. And in fact, Trump got very little done. I mean, part of my argument for why Trump was like not a fascist was he's like an incompetent Republican president. Like, like what did the fascist do in four years? I mean, he, he appointed right wing judges, which Ted Cruz would have done. Yeah. He passed a tax cut bill. Again, this is something that any Republican would have done. The Paul Ryan stupid corporate tax cut bill. And he cut EPA regulations, which was terrible. But again, this is like replacement level Koch brothers crap. Mm-hmm. Um, he was not a fascist. He was a kind of crazy, you know, not kind of, is crazy, incendiary president. So a lot of nutty things. And actually like inadvertently realigned the Republican Party in a smart direction, pushing them to a vaguely populist point on economics where he was like more right than like the Mitt Romney wing was where I think Trump understood that if you like attack trade deals or attack bad foreign policy, you can still keep Republican voters. That was like an insight that he accidentally stumbled onto, or maybe just knew it intuitively. But again, this wing is not invincible, right? And you see it where Trump does dominate the Republican party. He's the king of like the primary, but that also means you get some genuinely bad candidates coming out to the general election. Yes. And we should talk about them on this show. Look, I think your point about uh, the school stuff is really interesting. And we've been going back and forth about this yeah. and rising. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little it's a little complicated. I think you're right that there I think there was an evolving understanding of how long schools were going to be closed. That was shifting as CDC guidance, which I think deserves a lot of criticism, was shifting and there was a lack of transparency. And of course, there became a point where a longer term solution for how to keep people safe while still ensuring quality of education, that tipping point came without a really robust conversation about it on the left or even an acknowledgement that there were some legitimate concerns that parents had about the long term effects of being out of school. And I do think that there are answers to that question that don't involve this kind of laissez faire, throw everybody to the wolves, whoever gets COVID gets COVID attitude that a lot of conservatives do have. Um, And I've been talking a lot about HVAC systems and how effective they are and how little of the money that's been distributed for that purpose has actually been used to make the air pure in these schools. Ventilation is super important. I mean, I was in 2020 pushing outdoor schooling in Mm -hmm. in New York City. This was something they did in the flu pandemic. They had schooling on rooftops, like Mm -hmm. in parks, I got on a ferry boat. I mean, New York, I mean, New York City, and I I give Bill de Blasio credit for this. In in the fall of 2020, Bill de Blasio opened New York City public schools, and it was chaotic, and there were complaints, and it was not perfect by any means. But, you know, I I think I'm not trying to be, like, militant or saying, like, COVID COVID does matter. It's it's, it's horrible, and and we handle it very badly. Um, But I I do think, like, having, like, an open public space for kids to go, you know, I, I don't think... I think as, as a leftist, I actually don't think education is like a magic equalizer that, oh, you go to school and like there's great schools and terrible schools and you can magically become an amazing student. But I do think public school matters a lot because it's part of the social safety net. It's a very important part and it's important for, important for socialization in particular. Um, so I think like, I agree, there's like no nuance in the debate. You had like the Ron DeSantis side and then like Democrats were like, no opening schools is murder. Um, whereas I actually think New York was in the few places that approached it with some nuance. Uh, the West Coast did not. I think they paid a price for it, like Virginia didn't. Mm. Um, but if you look at New York, I mean, in fall of 2020, the public schools did open. Um, and I think it, it made a difference. I think, I think it helped kids. But yeah, I mean, the COVID threat was a hard thing to deal with. And no one, there was no playbook for it. So, I mean, that was, that was also hard, too. Yeah. Well, look, I... I, I... 
people who want to hear more of my take on this should listen to a radar I did last week where I, I cited, you know, some of the concerns and I think gave some credibility to a lot of the concerns that have come from the right over this issue and the messaging from the CDC and also talked about some of the ways that these coke aligned groups have been really pushing school opening, not because of these kind of social benefit reasons that we're talking about, but because there were, were these labor implications to the shutdowns that could have been, again, managed in different kinds of ways. And can we talk about schools opening without necessarily playing into this longer term effort to attack public schools, shift to private schools, et cetera, that is really going on here from the right? So, I mean, the teacher, I, I didn't agree with the teacher union view in this, but I'm a big supporter of teacher unions. You mm-hmm. see the teacher shortage now, you've got teaching. I mean, I'm a former teacher. I, I taught in public schools. I, I teach now on the university level. So I, I, I have firsthand experience with this. I mean, teaching is a profession that America does not do nearly good enough job of making attractive for top college graduates. I mean, a top college graduate goes to Wall Street, they go to waste their time at Facebook, they don't go into the public schools. And part of the problem is conservative Republicans, they, they especially in a lot of these, you know, poorer states or, or red states, they pay their teachers very badly. Mm-hmm. They have terrible working conditions and, and the young teachers burn out and they're gone in, in two or three years. And like, I have long been a proponent of making the profession more attractive, having higher starting salaries, Mm -hmm. getting young, ambitious people into teaching. And if Republicans want to care about public education all of a sudden, it seems like maybe they do, but maybe not. Um, It is about raising teacher salaries. It is about having unions. Um, It is about, you know, making these places people want to work. And yeah. right now it's a huge problem nationally. And even Fox News is covering it, I think, right? Like places going to four day a week schooling. I mean, it's, it's a big problem and it's been brewing for a long time. I think COVID pushed it over the edge. A lot of teachers are just like, you know, screw this. I'm making, you know, $40,000 and I'm being treated terribly by, you know, my district you have politicians, you know, meddling aggressively with the curriculum, right? And that's like a huge issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they leave. And now the joke is on the Republican governors, you know, to an extent Democrats too. You've got to fill those slots. And, and, I, and I think treating teaching as like a really good, serious profession is something we don't do in America. Other countries do it. They do it much better. Amen. I was raised by two teachers my entire life, and I have nothing but respect for the profession. And I, I really, truly do wish uh, that we supported them more in this country. But look, I could talk to you for another hour. Ross, thank you so much for being generous with your time. Can you tell the audience, again, they can obviously read you at New York Magazine, but where can they find you elsewhere? on that? Uh, find me on Twitter at Ross Barkin, just my first and last name, and also my Substack. It's just my name, Ross Barkin dot substack uh, dot com it's called political currents i write there every week i try to write multiple times a week and i do a lot of like new york stuff i do national stuff too i write a lot on the left uh, a lot on these sort of left dynamics and battles between ideological factions and so i think for for listeners here you know i i, I pride myself in being one of the people who tries to have like a nuanced view of this and try to genuinely understand what's going on so i suggest you subscribe thank you so much for that ross and you guys all know that this is your thursday public episode you can get a premium episode of bad faith in addition on mondays if you subscribe at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast And you can join me on Thursdays and Mondays, the days that the show drops over on the call-in app. You can listen to the debrief call-in and we can have a chat and I can hear all of your uh, complaints and critiques and um, compliments about the day's episode and whatever else has been going on in the zeitgeist that day. As always, take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.